Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about cleaning up your family tree. Now we've talked about this in the past. We've talked about data error reports. We talked a couple weeks ago about spring cleaning. Um, this is just kind of a continuation of that theme. I wanted to give you just some ideas of some things you could just really quickly do when you have a few minutes to just clean up your tree. One of the things I've discovered is that a lot of us, and I fall guilty to this too, a lot of us get into ruts where we always do the same thing. We come to our tree, we click on the leaf, we whatever, whatever your same thing is. And so we're always looking at our tree the same way. Well, the problem with that is, is that sometimes when you look at your tree in a different way, you see things you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And so I'm not just talking here about cleaning up your tree in like in the essence of, oh, you've got mistakes. I'm talking about cleaning it up in, in the view of looking at it a different way so that you can keep it healthy, so that you can make sure that you've got accurate information, so that you can make sure you're getting the most out of the tools, so that you can make sure that you um, know what to work on next, that you're not building up brick walls for yourself because of some of the things that you fall into the habit of doing. And so that's the, that's the point of today's presentation, is just to talk to you about different ways to look at your tree so that, um, so that it can be healthy, a healthy, well-growing family tree. Okay, we are going to talk um, about your online tree as well as Family Tree Maker. I focus specifically on Family Tree Maker because that is the tree software that Ancestry.com um, uses and it's the one that interfaces with, with the online tree. If you're using another offline desktop software uh, for your family history, most of the things I'm going to suggest will work for you as well. So um, let's go ahead and dive in. Let's talk about um, this first thing. The first thing that you can do is print a copy of your family tree. I know we love this idea of being all digital and a lot of us, myself included, just cling to that. Like we don't want any more paper, we don't want any more files, we don't want any more binders and bookshelves full of things. Um, and that's great, I'm a big fan of that. But every once in a while, um, I would encourage you to print a copy of your family tree because it's a different way to look at your tree. And it's a way that you might see things that you didn't see otherwise. So let me just show you on Ancestry where you can do that. When you're in Ancestry.com, you have a publish button here and you can click that and you can create a family tree starting with any person in your tree and you can tell it how many generations you want to include. So for example, Let's see if I can pull up. Uh, here's a sample of a tree. This is a tree I did. It's called a bow tie tree. And so this is my grandparents, my dad's parents here in the middle. And this is my grandfather's side of the family to the left and my grandmother's side of the family to the right. And it's starting with them. It's one, two, three, four, five, six generations. So this goes back to my fifth great grandparents on each side of my of this particular side of my family. So in my case, I would need to do two of these, one for these grandparents and one for my mom's parents. And so um, then I can just print this out uh, on a printer of my own, right? And I'm not looking, I mean, like if you wanted to have us, us print, Ancestry.com print that for you, that's fine too. Um, it will be, you know, giant and, and frame, frameable, right? But we're just talking about trying to get a working view of your tree in a different view. And so this allows you to just print it and then you can take a look at these. Um, I could zoom in here, right? And you can do this on your screen. Um, you can do this on your tree, right? But the difference is, again, when, sometimes when you're looking at something on a screen, you don't notice something, and, and yet when you're looking at it on paper, you do. I do this a lot of times. Um, I do some of the blog editing for Ancestry here, and sometimes people will send me a copy of their blog post, and I'll read it on my computer screen, and I'll miss half the errors. But if I print it out and actually read it on paper, sometimes I catch a little bit more. Something about that tactical connection tactile connection. Um, anyway, so you can do it on your screen, but I'm my encouragement is to print it out so that you have something in front of you so that you can look at it. That also means that as you find things, or if you find things, um, you're not having to flip back and forth through screens. If I had this piece of paper in front of me and I noticed, oh look, here, I have, I'm missing a picture for this great-grandfather. I think I have one. I need to go add that. 
I don't have to toggle back and forth between screens um, because I'm looking at this on the paper in front of me, then I can just go into my tree um, and do that. So lots of different ways you can do that, but the publish button on Ancestry will help you do it from your tree. In Family Tree Maker, you also have a publish feature there that you can use so that you can go in directly um, and print things out from there as well. But the idea is to print a copy of your family tree, um, look for obvious errors in time and place, particularly the further back you go. Just pay attention to things like, you know, was somebody born and died in England and yet their child was born in North Carolina? That might be a problem, right? Um, was this woman born a century after her child? And, you know, look for those kinds of obvious errors. Maybe you just made a mistake. Maybe you copied the wrong information. I'm notorious for transposing dates. You know, instead of putting in 1783, I'll put in 1873. Um, just look for some of those obvious things in that printed copy of your tree. Look for missing information. One of the benefits of printing out a family tree is that you can really clearly see where your holes are, where those big gaps are. And sometimes you have that information, you just haven't entered it into your tree. Or maybe you have entered it into your tree, but you haven't connected people correctly. Like maybe you unlinked a father and a son, and now it looks like that whole branch of the tree is empty. When it's not, the people are in your tree, you just need to reconnect those people. So um, print out a tree, it's just, again, another way to look at your tree to look for some of those obvious errors. The second thing I would recommend, or the second suggestion for you this weekend, is to review your list of all people. In your online tree, you have a list of all people. If I come over here to the search box on the top right-hand side, I can um, go to my last viewed person, go to the home person, or the bottom option there is my list of all people. Or, of course, I can just type directly in here, um, and it will bring up you know, lists of people from my tree. But uh, I want to go to this list of all people. That's going to take me to exactly what it says, a list of all people in my tree. It's an alphabetical list. Um, and if you have, you know, if you only have a couple hundred people in your tree, it's going to be really easy, even if you only have a couple thousand people in your tree, it's going to be really easy to just go through this list page by page, by page looking for, again, some of those obvious errors. If you have a lot of people in your tree, if you have a very, very large tree, um, in my case, I've got 63,000 people here, maybe you want to pick a particular surname. Um, you can type that into the search box over here, and it will then just show you just the people with that particular last name. Now, I chose this last name because um, here is an obvious error in my tree. There's actually a couple of them here um, that I want to point out. So you're going to be looking for weird characters that you've got in name fields. So one of the things that um, we sometimes see people do is they'll put like an asterisk in, an, in a last name field to denote that that's their direct line ancestor. Or in this case here, I've got quotation marks around this person's name. Um, I'm assuming that's because it's a nickname, not her actual name. Uh, the problem with weird characters, and by weird I just mean anything other than an alpha character, the problem with those characters is that's going to mess up your hinting and your searching. Anytime um, there are characters in those fields, those characters, the computer sometimes recognizes as other things. For example, an asterisk on Ancestry.com is actually a wild card, as is a question mark. And so those two characters in particular are really going to mess up your searches. So if you're doing an automatic search from the profile page of this person, any of those extra characters are going to cause some problems. So you're going to want to clean those up. Um, there are a few characters that are allowable and acceptable. One is, you'll notice here I've got, um, this is a series of five underscores. I did that because I don't know the first name of this person. So I know that there is a person in this family, uh, probably even has a gender assigned to them. Uh, I probably even maybe know a spouse or, a chil or children, um, but I didn't know the first name. And so I've just put in five underscores in that first name field so that, it, so that it's a quick flag to me, particularly in a situation like this, where I can say, oh, you know what, I, I have some research to do. I need to go find the first name of that person. You also start to see things like initials. I have a lot of family, um, especially in the South, where they either went by their initials or where the census taker only recorded their initials. And that's fine, because that's, you know, I entered what I found, but this is just a, 
a visual flag to me looking at my data this way that, oh, look, I probably have some additional research that I can do here on this family. I need to go do that, see if I can find out what their actual names are rather than just their initials. Now, of course, I know some people only have initials. I just I discovered that um, one of the things I learned this year uh, is that sometimes people only have initials. And maybe if that's the case, I'd make a note on this person so that I didn't keep trying to redo research. But um, the other thing you can quickly tell from this kind of a view, if I just scroll down the page a little bit, is you can see where you are missing information. Very quickly, I can see here that I've got a birthplace, but no birth date. Um, same with a couple of these. Here I've got no birth information at all and no death information at all. Here I've got about dates and before dates and after dates um, where apparently there is more research to be done. So rather than um, following shaky leaves or trying to keep pushing back on a particular branch of the family where I've hit a brick wall, again, viewing my data in this way gives me some places where I still have some work to do. And so it can help direct my work, my research time a little bit better. When I say, oh look, you know what? I have this after 1900 for his death date. I need to go find a death date for this person. So that's gonna be in your list of all people. In your online tree, you're gonna find it um, under the search box here, the tree search box. It's the bottom option there um, when you're viewing your tree. In Family Tree Maker, Everybody just has this little pop-out index here, and I can size this index however I want it, and I can size the information in here, and so I can skim through this tree index this way. Um, I can change the view of this. I can change it to be um, to how I sort it. I can also change what I show in this. I can show just a birth date or just a marriage date or just a death date. Um, in this case, I've got their lifespan showing where it shows a birth and death date or a year anyway um, in this index view. And again, it's a really easy way to just quickly skim through this and see, you know, here I've got a woman who was born in 1912 with no death date. She could still be alive, but probably not. So I need to go look for that. Here's an 1898 birth date with no death date. Um, again, just quickly skimming through that list helps some of those more obvious things I need to work on pop out at me. So you're looking for those incomplete dates and missing information that's going to direct your research a little bit, maybe get you back into a particular family that you've been away from for a while. Um, and who knows, new information comes online at Ancestry.com at a rate of about a million records a day. And so what might have not been there six months or a year or a week ago, um, that information could be available online to you now. Or you might need to you know, do a Google search and look up the local archive or library and make some phone calls or, or, or plan a visit for this summer. Okay, um, step number three is to check your tree for duplicates. We all have them. They all happen for a various number of reasons. As a matter of fact, I've done an entire video um, on how to check for duplicates and how they happen and how to prevent them from happening or at least minimize the occurrence. Um, but I'm going to encourage you to do that. Now, you can do that in your online tree, again, from this list of people. And if you only have a few people in your tree, you know, less than a few thousand, not going to be terribly time consuming. You just skim through this list here. I've got, for example, two Abigail Shipmans right in a row. One's born in 1817, one's born in 1816, but one's living in Pennsylvania and one's living in Tennessee. So I'm fairly certain those are not the same person. Okay. It's really easy just to skim through this list and see if I have duplicates or apparent duplicates. Here's a guy born in New Jersey with no birth date. Here's another Abraham Shipman born in New Jersey. Maybe I want to go check this guy out and see if he's the same person. Um, so lots of easy ways to just skim through that list so that you can make some of those um, quick decisions. Now, in Family Tree Maker, of course, it's easier. Software, by its nature, is a little bit more robust than online programs. So as much as I love my online tree, I... Um, as large as my tree is in particular, I couldn't do without Family Tree Maker. And so uh, in Family Tree Maker, there's actually a find duplicate people 
option under the edit button where it will actually do a an automatic check in your database and then present you with a list of people it thinks might be duplicates and then you can run through that list and either say yes they are and it will merge them or no they're not and it will leave them as two separate people now one of the cautions about automation one of the things is um, one of the challenges we have is that the more automated things become, the less we pay attention. Um, that's just kind of a human nature thing. And so just because it says that they're duplicate people does not mean that they are. It's just presenting you with possibilities. And so you need to know enough about your family uh, in order to make an intelligent decision about whether those people are the same person before you merge them. If you're not sure, don't do it, <laughs> okay? Um, just save it for another time. But this find duplicate people is a really quick automated way in Family Tree Maker to check for some of those more obvious duplicates that sometimes occur. And like I said, I've done a whole video on that. You can find it on our YouTube channel, walk you through, um, where I walk you through a little bit more about why that happens, um, how to prevent it from happening or keep it from happening, and um, how to run some of those checks. So you can use that list of pe all people online or use the find duplicate people under the edit button in Family Tree Maker. Okay, um, number four, and again, remember these are just suggestions for things that you can do or ways that you can look at your tree in a different way. And I've found that when I look at it in a different way, there are often things I can do to clean it up. Now, this is an exclusively family tree maker tip, and that is to run the data error report. I've also done an entire video on this report. Um, it is a report in family tree maker. So if I come here to my publish button, um, it's going to load a family tree for me. That's not what I wanted. I want to come in here to the person report and there is what we call our data error report. Now what that data error report um, does is it can create any number of, it can check for any number of errors and there are several of them. I would encourage you to just pick one. So for example, um, anybody whose birth date is after their father's death date and I want it to check everybody in my whole tree to see if there's anybody anywhere in my tree that has a birth date after their father's, um, actually it's more than a year after their father's death date. Um, and it's going to take a little while. You can see it's running over here on the bottom uh, right hand side. It's going to check my whole tree for, a, for this obvious error. Um, and you're actually going to see that it, it's going to come up with some. So I have some work that I need to do in my tree, it looks like. Um, but it's an automated way to check for those for those kinds of errors. Now I'll show it to you as soon as it's finished running, but let me just give you um, a couple of um, tips about this. Um, it checks for those obvious errors, but I would encourage you strongly to only run the report for one error at a time against your whole tree. So rather than running a report for all 23 or how, 27, however many errors there are, um, rather than running a report for all errors, run a report for one error at a time. Remember, we're just looking for quick, easy things we can do or different ways to look at our tree that can help us clean up some of this stuff. So if I come back over here, still running this report, doesn't surprise me. Um, my, my database is huge, and so sometimes if I run a database against the entire, uh, or run a report against the entire database, it takes uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, we'll get back to this. I'll show it to you um, before we finish if it's done running. So run those data error reports. There are things like children born before their mother, um, couples who were younger than 13 when they got married, uh, lots of different options in, the, in that data error report, different kinds of things you can check for. Um, and what I've found is that I'll print that list out or, or print it to a PDF and I'll start going through it and I'll start with the first person, and when I go to clean up the error, that leads me into more research. And so sometimes I'll only get one or two of those people in my tree cleaned up at a time, because again, that's directing my research. Uh, and so that's good, here we go, okay. And so that's good, right? But what it means is, is that I can still run this report, even though you know I'm a fairly conscientious genealogist, and you'll see here I still have a page, page and a half of errors uh, of this particular error where the birth date of the child occurred more than a year after the father died and it's not because you know I don't want to clean them up it's just because uh, you know I may start here Isaac Burleson born in 1811 I may go to him in my tree 
um, you know, f look at the information about him and realize I have some more research to do or I need to go double check those sources that I have or what notes do I have on this person? You know, what research have I done? Where did this information come from? I can't just change a date unless I know what to change it to. And so I'm not gonna go through and just remove these dates. I'm gonna go through one person at a time and clean them up. And so that takes a little bit of time. And so, but, but again, when you focus on one error at a time, this is a quick, easy thing you can do, right? I'm gonna go check out Isaac Burleson this weekend and clean up that family. And the data error report gives you another way to look at that data so that you can do that cleanup. Okay, my fifth and final tip for you today um, actually has to do with one of the bloggers in our genealogy community. His name is Randy Seaver. He runs a blog called Jenny Amusings. You can find it at jennyamusings.com. And every Saturday he posts what he calls Saturday Night Genealogy Fun, um, or SNGF. <laughs> and that's how it's tagged. That's how those blog posts are tagged on his blog. Um, and one of the things that I've discovered participating in Randy's little challenges is that he oftentimes gives me, again, a new way to look at my data. And when I do that, I see sometimes errors that I haven't seen before or holes that I hadn't seen before or things that I need to clean up or more information that I need to gather. So let me just give you an example of a couple of his um, Saturday night genealogy fun um, challenges that I've participated in. Uh, this last month he did one called how many surnames in your database where you used whatever software you use for your tree and you go through and you do a report about how many times each individual surname shows up in your database. Okay, so for example, he has 42,720 people in his database. Those 42,720 people make up 5,967 surnames. And so then he went through and created this report and was able to, again, look at his data in a little bit different way. I did that and actually found that I had um, some surnames that I had spelt that I had misspelled or that I hadn't standardized. I had a couple where I had um, uh, inaccurate information in that surname field or a weird character in that surname field. So again, it just helped me kind of clean some of those up. So that was that one. He also did one uh, earlier this year called your surname line with the longest stay in a specific locality where you got to go through and see, you know, do you have people who have always lived in the same place in your tree? Again, and again, just a different way to look at your data and sometimes it surfaces some interesting information. And then this one I love and I, not just because he based it off of a blog post I wrote, but also because I participate in this actual exercise about once a year. Uh, he entitled it, What's Your Ancestor Score? Um, but he talked about how you check 10 generations of your family tree and see how many of those people you know. And so, uh, you know, you, you have two parents and four grandparents and eight great grandparents and 16 great great grandparents. And of course, you know, that number doubles with every generation. And so then you go through your tree and you figure out how many of those people you've identified in each generation. And that gives you kind of a score for, you know, how, how done your family tree is. A lot of people will come along and say, oh, my family tree is all done. Uh, and the reality is it's they've traced one line back, but what about the other, you know, 8, 10, 16, 32, 40, you know, whatever, 64 lines in your family history. And so it's just, again, a different way to look at your data so that you can uh, maybe come up with some new avenues to research, some new locations to research, and you know, oftentimes you'll find some things to clean up along the way. Well, I hope this has given you some ideas. Um, I certainly don't expect you to do all of these things. Um, I don't expect that all of these things will resonate with all of you, but hopefully this has been time well spent and you have had some sparks of ideas of some things that you could do this weekend. And I just want to tell you that I know that if you will just take uh, one of these suggestions and try it, this opportunity to look at your family history data in a different way will very often lead you to new avenues to research and help you clean up that family tree. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.